Hey, good morning and welcome to Munhan's online worship service. It is so great to be with you in worship today. I uh, am so excited because we have a lot of fun things to tell you about because things are starting to reopen and uh, we're doing that cautiously but with great excitement and energy as well. So the first thing I want to tell you about is that Rhonda Knox is going to be starting a new Bible study uh, coming up on July 7th. It'll, they'll meet on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. and it's going to be Counterculture by David Platt. And I did this study years back and uh, it's a really fun one because you cover a lot of different hot button issues ranging from human trafficking and poverty and immigration to racism. A lot of really pertinent issues that need to be talked about, um, but doing that in a loving and biblical way. And so I hope that you'll join us for that. It's going to be really, really good. Kids, get excited because this Thursday is Topsy Turvy Thursday, but not on Facebook Live like it has been. We'll be in person and in the green space, and uh, it's just going to be so much fun to be there together. You'll be in your little hula hoops as you do some social distancing, but they're might be some water guns involved, I don't know, um, but it's going to be a blast. I hope that you'll join them for that, for that music, the games, the Bible study. And then at 6, uh, so the Topsy Turvy is at 5, but at 6, you'll go to Sal's together and get you a snowball to just celebrate what God has been doing. And youth, uh, we'll meet at 6 at Sal's for our snowballs and get to enjoy that and enjoy time together as well. So I'm really, really excited about that. But adults, don't feel like you're left out of this. We have something for you too. Uh, we'll be doing these driveway socials across town at uh, this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, we're just going to get together in people's front yards and kind of smaller groups and do some social distancing, but hanging out, just having fun and fellowship there. And you can bring your own chairs or drinks or snacks or whatever you'd like to make that time uh, just great. It'll be so much fun to just be with one another. And last but not least, on June 28th, we're going to play a big game, church-wide game of kickball at Pontiff Park. And so I'm super, super excited about that. That'll be next Sunday at 6 p.m. And uh, just bring, uh, you know, your chairs, your um, your drinks, your uh, everything else. Just bring your A game, really. That's what you really need for it. And uh, let's just have fun together. It'll be so much fun to just be there and uh, watch or play or whatever we're doing there, just relaxing and being in the company of our friends from church. And so there's a lot of stuff coming up uh, that we have to be excited about and that we have to thank God for. And so let's do that this morning. Let's give God all the glory and praise for allowing us to take these steps cautiously but with excitement about what He's going to do in us and through us during this season. Welcome to worship at Munholland Holland United Methodist Church. I'm Jonathan Beck, senior pastor. I'm delighted that you've chosen to be with us uh, because when we bring ourselves into worship, God is there and he'll show up in great ways. And I know that God wants to touch your life today. I'm so glad you're joining us as we talk about growing up. Uh, growing up as Christians, uh, Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter three, and we'll see what he has to say about what it means to grow up and how we, can grow up in Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this time together, this time with you and, and time with each other. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this uh, gathering, that you would bless our hearts as we lay them before you, as we open up our minds to understand and perceive your, what you have for us, Lord, in all that is done. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in the responsive reading from Psalm 89. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. Blessed are those who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. We rejoice in your name and celebrate your righteousness. <laughs> Thank you. 
affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. Good morning and welcome to SGN, Lynn Holland's Ministry Minute. I'm Ann Birdsong, and today I'm here to share with you a lot of Lynn Holland's really good news. I know what you're thinking. Good news? How is this girl going to come up with any good news when there is nothing but confusion, chaos, and strife everywhere around us in the world today? Well, that's exactly why I'm here to tell you about a Bible study that Rhonda Knox is going to be offering in just a few weeks. It's called Counterculture, and it's by David Platt, and it deals with these exact issues that we're hearing about today, issues that are dividing us. These issues like racism, immigration, poverty, sex slavery, abortion, and many more. David Platt gives us biblical structures on how to walk through these issues with courage and compassion together. Because we know as Christians, we are better together. So here to tell us more about the class is Rhonda Knox. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, Ann. I was drawn to this study because in our culture today, the issues that we face have such diverse, conflicting opinions about them. I wanted to know from a scriptural perspective um, what the Bible says about them and how I, as a Christian, should respond to them. Um, so I'm beginning the study on July the 7th. It will be from 6 to 7.15. It will be for six weeks, and it's going to be on Zoom so that no matter where you find yourself this summer, you can join us. It, Zoom is very easy to set up. I can walk you through it. If you don't have access to a smartphone, computer, or the Internet, then possibly I can hook you up with someone who's taking the class. If you'd like to join me, I would love to have you. Just uh, email me at rnox at munhollandchurch.org, and I will get you registered, and I will send you all the information you need to obtain the materials. But we would love to have you join us. Thank you, Rhonda. Well... Why don't we do a check on the weather? Elise, how is the weather where you are? It's sunny and bright. This is the best day of my life here. Who do you have with you checking out the weather? Snoopy and Ling Ling. Oh, great. Oh, I need to take a break. Keep breathing. There's ducks. Woohoo! Thank you, Elise. So here we are back at the segment that I like to call, What Did I Miss? And there is so much that we all miss. So while sticking with the theme, Better Together, I thought, why not show you some of the ways that Holland is working at us coming back together? That's right. It has been almost three months since we have all been together. And this week, both the children and the youth were able to come back together for the first time face to face. And we have some events in the book for the adults for next week. And I am so excited about this that I thought, why not go out and show you face to face? Let's go. All right, Wilson, we are so excited you're here with the youth today. And uh, it's been a long time since you guys have come together as a group. So I thought maybe you could just explain to us why is being better together better? Well, we've been seeing each other uh, with a screen in between us on Zoom or Facebook Live, and so we're just so excited to be in person. And so we're face-to-face, uh, -face, or at least mask-to-mask, -mask. and uh, that's why I have this size medium t-shirt on that says Better Together on it, because I'm just so excited to be in person. It's All really right. Loud, but... <laughs> well, we are definitely better together, and I know the youth are happy to be together, too. Thanks, Wilson.
the youth getting together this week, but the children are getting together this week as well. Topsy Turvy Thursday moved out to the green space this week. No more Facebook Live. We are live here and we are definitely better together. talked about how bringing the children together is better, bringing the youth together is better, and I'm here with Jonathan Beck to explain to you how bringing the congregation together is better. It certainly is better, Anne. Uh, Zoom has been nice being able to see faces and to talk, uh, but it does not replace being truly together, sitting together, talking together, uh, and it is so much better. So. I am inviting every one of you from Munholland to come to my house uh, and for a driveway uh, social. It's going to be a ton of fun. 6.30 on Wednesday. I'm at 3417 Thomas Drive, which is just a couple blocks behind Trader Joe's. Bring your own drink, bring your own chair, and I brought the tape measure to make sure that you are six feet away from Ann Birdsong. <laughs> Ann, Yim from here you go. Okay, sorry, I missed the cue. <laughs> All right, six feet apart this Wednesday, our first front yard social get together. I hope to see you there. Coming together socially is really good, but there's nothing wrong with a little healthy competition. What do you think, Marlene? Ann, I totally agree. And there's nothing like coming together for a game of kickball. Next Sunday, June 28th at Pontiff Park from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. So bring your picnic dinner, chairs, blankets, drinks, so we can all have a little healthy competition because we're better together. We hope to see you all there. Well, that concludes this week's SGN Ministry Minute. I'm Ann Birdsong, reminding you that no matter how hard it gets in the world, there is always good news. And remember, through fellowship, prayer, and discipleship. We are always better together.
Our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I do not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you not milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worth worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and the other, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for another day to come together and worship you. You give us love, guidance, and compassion each and every day. Please soften our rogue, rebellious hearts and give us loving, submissive hearts. As believers, I pray that our spiritual development and growth will be like a deep root system on a splendid tree, unwavering, 
grounded during life storms and willing to nourish those around us. May our daily life be one of godly intention and self-control, fueled by a desire for spiritual maturity and development into the people you created us to be. We love you and we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's such a blessing to be part of the kingdom of God. Uh, God allows us to uh, see him do amazing things in the world. And, and he calls us just to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then see what he does with it. We are able to give our tithes and our offerings to support his church. Uh, I encourage you, if you're a friend of Munholland, a uh, member of Munholland, to support our ministries. You can do that online or through the mail. If you're a member of another church, please support your church because when all of the churches all the followers of Jesus Christ offer their best we are going to see God do incredible things right here in our community let us pray Lord God who we are is all because of who you are what you have given to us so Lord in gratitude we give back to you these offerings multiply them for your good kingdoms work in Jesus name Amen how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. that mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice cry out among the scoffers my sin that nailed him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast my Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all His only Son to make wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss! The Father turned His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot. I know with all my heart His wounds have made my ransom His wounds have made my ransom We continue our worship reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm picking up where Abigail left off. What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. 
The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, and that is Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we have a problem, don't we? We have a problem in the church. We have a problem, problem in the culture. And that is that people don't want to grow up. You know, it'd be nice if we were always little and people take care of us. Nice when we have no big decisions to make. Uh, it's nice when we can just sort of go through life and everything happens around us and we just feel safe and that nothing depends upon us. It's nice not to have to make those difficult decisions, to gruelingly go through and try to figure out what's the best thing to do because it matters the decision that you make. We don't want to grow up. We don't want to grow up. It's a big temptation. But you know what? We have to. Let's say there's a five-year-old, and this five-year-old is running around. They're really cute, and uh, that five-year-old is playing with friends and dancing all around, but sometimes gets a little uh, cranky and, and pouts and all. Sometimes uh, wants to get a toy that the other person has. Uh, you know how five-year-olds are, right? They're cute as can be. They do all this stuff, but boy, aren't they cute. This is just that stage in life. But what if you have a 15-year-old who's acting like that five-year-old? You think, this is a little disturbing. Hasn't anything happened between five and 15? Why aren't they more mature? That's a problem. A 15-year-old should not act like a five-year-old. But how about a 40-year-old? What if you saw a 40-year-old who was acting like a five-year-old, who thought the world revolved around them, a narcissist, who wanted to be waited on, wanted everybody to take care of him. Uh, perhaps uh, they were uh, also not wanting to make any decisions, but uh, just wanted to float through life. Someone unwilling to share, unwilling to play with others. That on wouldn't only be disturbing, but it would be an indication of a incredibly profound psychological, spiritual, and emotional problem. People have to grow up. It's the natural course of things. And yet sometimes we try to hold back from growing up. Whenever we grow up and move from one stage to another, we are giving up something to gain something more. And the thing that we gain is always more of a challenge. And Paul's saying, you need to rise to this challenge. Amy Grant wrote a song back in the 80s, uh, one of my favorite decades. Uh, she wrote a song called Fat Little Baby. Talked about how there are people out there, Christians out there, and uh, how they, you know, they were saved. That's good enough for them. Uh, they'll go to a church and have a, a lunch, a spiritual lunch uh, once a week. Uh, they'll give their language a spiritual rest for that morning. Uh, and that, that's good enough for them. They've tried, she says, solid food once or twice, but says that doctrine leaves them cold as ice. And her refrain is this. He's just a fat, 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 fat little baby. He wants his bottle, and he don't mean maybe. You see, that's the way too many of us are. We, we like being immature Christians, children, and we're all there at some point, right? But Paul is saying, look, you shouldn't be like mere infants. You should be grown up. Why am I giving you pablum? Why am I giving you baby food? But that's all you can handle right now. But you need to grow up. You need to start eating solid food. You need to start growing intellectually, growing emotionally, growing spiritually. That's the challenge. One of the things that indicate that there is uh, immaturity, he says, is jealousy. I want what that person wants. You know, it, whenever that person gets something new, I want that for myself. If I have something and they got something better like it, I want that which is better. And jealousy does not give any room for gratitude. It doesn't give any room for thanksgiving, and it doesn't have any room for contentment. 
Jealousy is a horrible thing and it will keep us immature. Another thing that he says is an indicator of immaturity uh, is quarreling. You know, quarreling comes off in jealousy as well, right? Uh, but quarreling is pitting yourself against the other person <clears throat> rather than realizing that together we know more, together we can be wiser, together as we talk through it, we can come up with a better solution. The quarrelsome person is not listening to the other person, but only trying to make their point, to make you see that they are right and you are wrong. Do you know anybody like that? Maybe we're a little bit like that from time to time. The quarrelsome person is immature. I hate to admit it, but I've had some pretty immature moments in my life here recently. But God calls us to grow up, to not put ourselves first, to not think that we're the only one that knows anything, to not think that we have all the facts or that we interpret all the facts all the right ways. Quarrelsomeness is immature. Paul says, grow up. Don't be quarrelsome. He also says, don't be factious. Don't pit yourself against another person. Don't pit your group against another group. Don't pit other groups against each other. Yet Paul says this, this faction, factional behavior uh, of, of splitting people apart and using them against each other uh, it is horrendous. It's it so immature and has no part in the kingdom of God. The beautiful thing about the gospel of all of scripture is the, the understanding, that core understanding of everybody is made in the image of God. So for Christians, for the church, we are trying to polish the image in every single person and to help every single person made in the image of God to flourish but that only can happen when we come together and work together so everybody flourishes, everybody's image is polished so that God shines through us all. It's a beautiful thing. You know, Paul talks about that <clears throat> where he, he says, look, uh, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're, we're not talking putting Jews against Gentiles. You know, we're not talking about putting men against women. Uh, we're not talking about pitting the uh, cultural uh, cultured people versus the uncultured, uncouth. That has no place in the kingdom of God. But it's about learning to value each other and to polish that image, to help each other be their best as God intended. Factionalism has no place Let's grow up, Paul says. Let's work together for the common good because we can agree upon that, that we need to build each other up and pull together to make a better society. Paul says, put away jealousy, put away quarreling, put away factiousness. Let's mature a little. He says, you need to stop being mere humans but become fully formed followers of Christ. He says, you know, some people are saying, I follow Paul. Uh, some people say, I follow Apollos. He said, look, I'm not God, I'm not Jesus. Don't follow me. I was pointing the way to Jesus. I laid a foundation as Jesus only. He said, don't put your hopes, don't pin your identity on any person, only on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So he, he really lays it down about that when he's telling us to focus on God. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but it is God who made everything grow. Think about that. There's someone who, at the beginning just puts the seed down. And then someone along the way that does watering, a whole bunch of people along the way that waters it. And through that time, we see growth and increase till there's a time of harvest and people get to celebrate in the harvest at the end. And you know what? He says that's the way it is with the kingdom of God. We each play our part, but all that growth all along the way, that's God. Let's recognize that that's God who's at work. I like that metaphor. <clears throat> it helps us to, to remember our place, not to think too highly of ourselves but of the importance and the joy of doing our part. It's always been a mystery to me how God works. Uh, I've had opportunity to bring people to Christ and for them to give their lives to the Lord uh, and be transformed. And every time it's amazing to me 
because I know that God's been at work in their lives from years before and that other people have been a part of that. And now in this moment, this person is saying, I need forgiveness for these sins. I, I, I need wisdom and guidance for these decisions I'm trying to make. And I say, Jesus Christ can offer you forgiveness and the Holy Spirit can give you the understanding and insight and the wisdom you need for those decisions. And it is always amazing that God does something incredible in their life and there is a harvest and their lives are changed forever. It wasn't John and it wasn't the people who planted and watered. It's all God who made it grow and brought about uh, a tremendous transformation of someone's life. Paul uses his, himself as an example. He says, by the grace given me that he is doing his work. That grace given to him was that he was a very bright young man. He studied in the best schools. He studied under Gamaliel, the greatest theologian of his time. He knew scripture, every word of the Old Testament. He had memorized it. Uh, he had been in theological debates and he was zealous for his God. God used that. He took those gifts, those graces, those, that understanding, and then used it and transformed it for his kingdom in following and serving Jesus Christ. See, we all have natural talents as part of the grace. We all have God-given gifts as part of the grace. We all have the fruit of the Spirit, which is part of the grace, but they're all pulled together in a unique way, which is only you and only me. We have a grace that's given to us. How do you find that grace? One of the best ways is being in a, a Bible study. We have one uh, in the Methodist ch church called Disciple Bible Study. And Disciple Bible Study goes through all of the uh, scripture, 85, 90% of it in one year, nine months. And during that time, you're with a small group. You get to know each other really well. You study scripture, you talk as a group, and toward the end of that time, uh, the group helps you to see your gifts. So from scripture, you begin to see what your gifts are. Your group uh, affirms those gifts, and then you get an opportunity to try in the church. You know, God had given me particular gifts, and I didn't know where to use them, how to use them. And I thought maybe as a missionary. So I went to Mexico and I served as a missionary for nine months. Uh, but that didn't seem quite right in the use of my gifts. And so then I felt God's call toward pastoral ministry, and that has been a fit for me. You're not always gonna know right away, but you need to think, to reflect, and to reflect with others. What are the gifts God's given me to use in the world? So he says, by the grace given me, he says, I've laid a foundation as a wise builder. You know, wise builder, not haphazardly, but with intention. Not someone who's starting out of ignorance, but someone who's studied somebody who has reflected, somebody who has tried to understand on a deeper level so that he can build well. That's part of the maturity of a Christian is that we don't reflexively respond, but we respond out of a reflection on scripture, reflection on what God has been saying to us so that we do so in a constructive and a mature way. He says, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. You know, it's bigger than all of us, isn't it? Paul saying, I have my part to play, but it's on that foundation of Jesus Christ. But his part is important. It's so important. The part you play is so wonderful and, and, and what you're doing is so important. It ought to make you raise your head in pride. I am part of the kingdom of God. And when you realize that small part, it's not the whole thing it's only a part in there, then it should make you humble and realize that it's bigger than you, it's bigger than me, and it's grand in its scope far beyond. We can take great pride in doing our part as a wise builder, and we can be humble because we do it shoulder to shoulder with so many others and through people's lives throughout time. And then he says uh, that someone else is building on it. <clears throat> someone else. He realizes that he's handing it off. You know, the great cathedrals in Europe were built over many, many years. 
the cathedral uh, in Milan it was started in 1388 and it was finished in 1965. It was built over 577 years. Westminster Abbey, it was exactly 500 years in the making. That's the way it is with the kingdom of God. It's not something made in a moment. It's not even something that's made over a year or even one lifetime, but it's handed off to the next and to the next. Each generation is so important. Each person who's involved in the building and in, in their different crafts is incredibly important. And the architect has set that grand design and they each are doing their part to make the vision a reality. I have a friend and we were in a small group, Wednesday morning small group many years ago. He had had a rough time in life, very difficult. He had made some bad choices and he was probably 50 years old or so and he had, God had come into his life and he had been transformed and his life was coming together. And then that's when I met him and he was part of the study. And we talked about that metaphor of the cathedral, how we each are playing our part. And he says, you know, I, I don't think I'm gonna be doing anything big on that cathedral of, of God's kingdom. Maybe I'm only gonna be working on that gargoyle up in the corner on a far roof of the cathedral. And maybe all I'm doing is working on its ear. But I'm gonna make that the best gargoyle, gargoyle ear I can. I love that, you know, what a, what a perspective. There's a humility there, but there's that I'm giving it my all. And that's the way it is with you and me, that we need to grow up and be mature and decide to give it our best, to give it everything we have because the kingdom of God is so beautiful, so majestic, and God is leading us toward it. Paul says to the church, grow up. Put aside jealousy, put aside quarreling, put aside this faction, uh, factionalism. Let's grow up and get about the work of the kingdom. We are co-workers with Jesus Christ. Let's do our part. Find out what your grace is that's been given to you and work at it with all your might. And you will see God do unbelievable, unimaginably good things with your offering. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for what you do for us, that you have given us grace. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You, you have given us all that we need, not for ourselves, but for your kingdom. Help us to continue to grow up in you and in a life that's worthy of the calling so that we can give our full lives, everything we have to experience the joy of your kingdom unfolding before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go out into the world and do the good work of God.